in just a few years' time that the people of Scotland will be asked to make one of the most important decisions in our long history. Between now and that day, every man and woman in the country will be thinking about what's best for Scotland. There's a lot of work to be done if we're to move forward as a nation, and the time to start that work is now. Good afternoon, conference. I feel very, very honoured uh, to be able to speak to you uh, this afternoon about preparations for the independence referendum. All of us joined the Scottish National Party to help deliver independence for Scotland, and current circumstances mean that we are the best placed generation in the 80 year history of the SNP to deliver this historic, exciting, and transformative change for our country. Having worked so hard to secure the first ever minority SNP government in 2007, we know how much work is involved in winning a national election. In many ways, we worked even harder to secure the trust of the people and the first ever majority government with the historic SNP victory in May. With a mandate to hold a referendum, we now look forward to this challenge, the biggest ever challenge, the biggest opportunity for modern Scotland. Shortly after the Scottish Parliament election, the First Minister asked if I would continue in the post of campaign director preparing for the independence referendum. And in the months since May, we've been working very hard behind the scenes. We've received significant input and advice from throughout the party. We are extremely grateful for the detailed submissions from members, from branches, from constituency associations, from councillors and parliamentarians. Thank you all for the guidance. Thank you for your ideas. Thank you for your encouragement. And it's clear from all the feedback that SNP members are raring to get on with the campaign. 
Initial deliberations and research has already led to a series of presentations within the SNP. I've spoken and taken feedback from the National Executive Committee, from branch and constituency meetings, from the annual councillors' conference, and from meetings with our parliamentarians, with our ministers, and with our cabinet secretaries. So today, we are announcing that the independence referendum campaign is starting. We will work as hard as possible in an unprecedented national campaign to secure the majority yes vote for a sovereign, independent Scotland. say that again. <laughs> we will work as hard as possible in an unprecedented national campaign to secure the majority yes vote for a sovereign, independent Scotland. Um, So, we will start by galvanizing and motivating our members and supporters. We will start by working with the many supporters of independence with no party affiliation and those in other parties. We will engage with different sectors of society to raise confidence, optimism and understanding of the independence case. We will reach out within our communities door by door, street by street, in the most unprecedented campaign of mobilization and communication by the SNP and in the history of Scottish politics. Already at a national level, we've started the necessary project planning for the campaign, including research and brand development. We're updating our Activate system to deliver the best cutting-edge IT support to the campaign. We've also started the necessary financial planning to properly fund the independence campaign. And today, I'm delighted to confirm that the independence campaign has been generously supported by the late great Scots poet and macker Edwin Morgan with a substantial contribution of £918,000 which is ring-fenced for the referendum campaign. Appreciating this financial generosity, we're also inspired by the words of Edwin Morgan, who wrote the formal poem for the opening of the new Scottish Parliament building. He wrote, Dear friends, dear lawgivers, dear parliamentarians, you are picking up a thread of pride and self-esteem that has been almost, but not quite, oh no, not quite, not ever broken or forgotten. When you convene, you'll be reconvening with a sense of not wholly the power, not yet wholly the power, but a good sense of what was once in the honour of your grasp. All right, forget it or don't forget the past. Trumpets and robes are fine. But in the present and the future, you will need something more. And Edwin Morgan was absolutely right. We need something more. We need independence. We are indebted to him for his inspiration and for his financial support. With these resources, we're going to be able to support campaign efforts on the ground, in our communities, the length and breadth of Scotland. This is why all of us as SNP members need to start now. Start right now in making this happen. So step one of the independence referendum campaign is to galvanise and motivate our members and supporters. 
When we leave here, we need to make arrangements in every one of our constituency associations to call a special meeting within the immediate weeks ahead. We need to invite every single one of our members to attend. This will not be an ordinary meeting. You'll be discussing the campaign in your constituency. You will start your planning, including direct communication with all of our identified supporters. You will be working hand in hand with your local parliamentarians, your local councillors and your aspiring council candidates. Along the way, you will increase your local membership and you will find many supporters who want to help out. Of course, this is already happening in many parts of the country and I'd like to share some feedback from those involved. So firstly, give a warm welcome to Ben McPherson. Conference. I am the Vice Convener and Political Education Officer for Edinburgh Central Constituency Branch. And uh, like all of you, we are already thinking about the referendum. In preparation for this unique opportunity to change our country for the better, we have already set in motion two significant initiatives. Firstly, and quite rightly, we are getting organised. We are considering how to integrate the council elections next year with preparing for the referendum. We are bringing together all the talents of our members and creating specialised campaigning non-executive positions. We are pulling data together, we are identifying supporters and we are planning a voter registration drive to connect with the so-called apathetic. Secondly, in our branch, we are also getting fired up and wised up. Our party's strongest assets are our enthusiasm and our knowledge, and we must utilise both of these to maximum effect. At our branch meetings, we've launched a, month, a monthly policy forum to debate, discuss and re-emphasise party policy on all of the reserved issues. We are doing this to make sure we can give clear answers to the public's concerns. Furthermore, as a branch, we've decided that on the doorsteps, our energy is vital, and so we're encouraging our activists to show their passion. Today marks the beginning of the future for Scotland, a different future, a future where we as a people do what it takes to change our country for the better, where we do what it takes to positively transform the circumstances of everyone who lives here. This referendum campaign will be more than a political event. It will be a national movement, and we will lead it. We will lead it with our ambition, our vision, and our determination. Our determination to approve, improve Scotland across all the areas of government, to improve life in Scotland for all of our citizens throughout our society, for our friends and our neighbours and our families. This referendum campaign will make a difference, and it is you, SNP members, who will be at the heart of making that difference. We will transform Scotland, and the campaign to deliver that begins right now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. One of the most effective campaign teams in the SNP is provided by our youth and our student wings. We've all noticed how many new young members the SNP has. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for your enthusiasm. And for some time now, the YSI and the FSN have been travelling around the country in support of local campaigns. To update us on their current efforts is David Linden. Please give a warm welcome to David. Thank you. 
Friends, the YSI and FSN have been touring the country talking about moving Scotland forward and I want to tell you about the amazing responses and results we're getting on the doorsteps. We're out in the doors and university campuses asking the independence question and delegates, the answers are mind-blowing. The people of Scotland are ready for freedom and we will deliver it. Our movement has been, the exist, has been in existence for over 75 years and delegates, independence is coming. And Glasgow polls show university students voting in majorities of 50 and 60% to support independence. In Stornoway, they're asking why energy-rich Scotland has fuel poverty, not with independence. In Stirling, they're asking why Scotland is powerless when pensions and benefits, not with independence. In Dundee, they're asking why Scotland uh, is having to choose between heating or eating at winter time, not with independence. In Renfrewshire, 17-year-olds are asking why Scotland doesn't get a say over illegal wars, not with independence. In Edinburgh, Telford College students are asking why we don't have the economic levers to decide our own finances, not with independence. And just last week in Eastern Bartonshire, they were asking why we have the abomination that is trident nuclear weapons on the River Clyde. <laughs> Delegates, not with independence! Friends, we, the independence generation, are ready to deliver independence. Between now and referendum day, we will not rest, and we will keep chapping doors, keep speaking to students, and keep winning yes votes for Scotland. We owe it to the people who have gone before us. Campbell once said, devolution is like a motorway to independence with no exits. Let this once-in-a-lifetime campaign be an autobahn with no exits, and let's get the accelerator down and onwards to independence. Thank you. So, we've done step one of the independence refer referendum campaign. We're galvanising and we are motivating our members and supporters. Step two of the independence referendum campaign is to work with the many supporters of independence with no party affiliation and in other parties. As we are already finding, there are many people out there who don't have a political affiliation and support independence, as well as people who have a different affiliation and support independence. You'll know people in your area who fit these categories, and we need to ensure we can maximise cooperation on the ground and at a national level. We've already been in communication with the Independence Convention and look forward to a close working relationship in the campaign, as well as with prominent supporters of independence. One of our party colleagues already working hand-in-hand -hand with the Independence Convention is our excellent candidate in the recent Inverclyde by-election. Please give a very warm welcome to Anne McLaughlin, who's a member Member of the Executive Committee of the Cross Party Independence Convention. Conference, I have been so looking forward to the day that independence comes of age when we as the SNP can say independence no longer belongs to us, it belongs to the people of Scotland. That day has come. It's here now, and we are saying to the people of Scotland, independence is there. It's waiting for you. Take it. Make what you will of it. And as Scotland's First Minister said yesterday, there are no limits. I joined the Scottish Independence Convention because it brings together people of all political parties and none, and I would encourage each of you to join and each of your branches to affiliate. I can't tell you how good it felt to sit in a room with members of Solidarity, the SSP and the Green Party and hear their genuine excitement about the forthcoming referendum. But what was even more energising was all the people who said, I'm not into politics, but I want my country to be independent. Conference. They are the people we need to encourage in the run-up to our referendum. Those men and women who are not into politics, but who are into Scotland, are into justice, and are into independence. Everyone is welcome. There really are no limits. 
You don't even have to live in Scotland. Who read the marvellous interview in The Scotsman with Billy Bragg where he declared his absolute certainty that independence will be good for England for all the right reasons? Billy Bragg, you are so right, and you too are welcome to join our movement. In 2014, we have another big event in the Commonwealth Games, and in reaching out to non-party political supporters of independence, there's an obvious group we need to work with, and that's those Scots originally from Commonwealth and other countries who know all about gaining independence, because they've been there, they've done that, and every year they produce t-shirts to prove it. <laughs> My closest links are with the African and Caribbean Scots, said to number around 20,000, and conference they get us. They get independence. They have more difficulty in getting the unionist argument because, of course, most of them have one day of the year when they throw huge parties to celebrate their independence. I believe the Scottish Independence Convention will be a fantastic vehicle for mobilising their support, and we need it. Not just for the yes vote, but we need them to be getting out there and telling their fellow Scots there is nothing to fear. So, Conference, let's support the Convention. Let's all of us help it to reach out to everyone who's not into politics but is into independence. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Another of our colleagues who is focused on persuading people in the months and years ahead is Central Scotland MSP Claire Adamson. So please give a warm welcome to Claire Adamson, MSP. Conference, I am a Lanarkshire lass. I was born in Motherwell and am infinitely proud of the part my hometown played in our party's history in returning Dr McIntyre as the first ever Scottish National MP. Election count in May was held in the new £70 million Ravens Craig Regional Sports Centre, funded by our Scottish Government and North Lanarkshire Council and marking the regeneration of that area. It was very poignant for me because it was a closure of Ravens Craig that brought me to the cause of Scottish independence. My family and friends were ordinary Lanarkshire people who had believed that the post -war, in the post-war labour tradition, and to be honest, when I joined the SNP in Star Wars fashion, they thought I had gone to the dark side. <laughs> My family were from working class trade union traditions, highly valuing education. I wasn't the first person to go to uni university, but I was the first to join the SNP. <laughs> engaging and persuading people about the benefits of independence since day one, and it is a great joy to me that before he died, my father stood as an SNP councillor in Motherwell. It is our positive message, our competence and our delivery of our promises that have opened doors to the length and breadth of this country, not least of which are in the central belt, where we won back Hamilton, Black Hall and Stonehouse, we won East Kilbride, Airdrie and Shorts and Cumbernauld, and where I stood very nearly won back Dr McIntyre's seat, reducing Lord Jack McConnell's majority to just 587. <laughs> I have believed in passionately the people in Central Scotland are now recognising in our successes in both councils and in government. Put simply, the fear factor has gone. People are now embracing optimism and self-determination. I'm taking every opportunity I can to engage with civic society in Lanarkshire. I stood a few weeks after the election in the rooms that had been the HQ headquarters for the Labour candidate in Motherwell and Wishaw. I was invited there by the Trades Council to talk about our vision for Scottish independence. Conference, the door is open. It's now our job to invite the Scottish people through. Thank you very much.
Thanks very much, Claire. So we've heard about step two of the referendum campaign, where we'll be working with the many supporters of independence with no party affiliation and in other parties. We now move on to step three of our referendum campaign, and that is to engage with different sectors of society to raise confidence, optimism and understanding of the independence uh, case. Already our parliamentarians are engaging with different sectors of Scottish society. They are working, like you, as ambassadors for independence. To tell us a little about his work as an independence ambassador, I'd like you to welcome Glasgow MSP Hamza Youssef, who was elected in the May election landslide. Hamza, welcome. Conference, it really is a delight to be standing here before you as the elected representative of that SNP stronghold of Glasgow. Uh, I, That was cheap applause, I know, but I couldn't help it. But I, I truly do feel privileged to be in this position uh, at all. I say that, delegates, because it was merely 70 years ago, uh, while our party was in our very infancy, that my grandfather was working in a family-run business in a small village in India. He was a master tailor, and so in the morning and the afternoon he would spend hours sewing clothes for the locals in that village. And in the evening he would shut up shop. But instead of going home to have his dinner, he would take to the streets and peacefully protest against British rule in his homeland. Of course, of course... <laughs> Of course, conference, his freedom and his fight for freedom and self-determination was successful in 1947 with the creation of an independent and sovereign India and Pakistan. And conference, he could not have imagined that merely seven decades later, his grandson would be carrying on this proud family tradition of fighting for independence in a country called Scotland. Delegates, I tell you this story to highlight that Scotland truly is a land of opportunity for all, regardless of your race, your religion or your ethnicity. Having a multicultural society is at the very ethos of what we believe in as civic nationalists. We've accepted people as Polish Scots, as Scots Asians, as Chinese Scots and Italian Scots. Not only that, we've adopted their cuisine and I'm very grateful for the chicken tikka masala <laughs> and the spaghetti bolognese. So, fellow nationalists, as a party we've been making links with all these communities, in fact, over the last 20, 30 years. And that relationship was built on the foundations of mutual trust and respect, and it served us well. So, Scots of all diverse communities have now thrown their weight behind the nationalist cause. At a recent dinner that I attended in Glasgow, over 500 people from every strand of that diverse tartan pledged to give their all for the cause for independence. Just as so many have done for their own homelands, they promise to pound every pavement, to knock every door, to speak to every person in every language, for this the most noble of all noble causes, self-determination and independence for Scotland. So conference, we will continue to work with every community in Scotland because our party is about communities and societies. We have, of course, some amazing individuals in the SNP, but delegates, let us never forget that we are not about individuals or a party brand, but we are truly a global movement. We are, as one person said, the wind that blows in our city streets. We are the water that flows in our gallant glens. We are the ink that dries on the pages of history as we go forth to write another chapter in our nation's story. And conference, if we reach out to every Scot, new and old, and work harder than we've worked ever before, then I've got no doubt that that next chapter will start with the words, and so Scotland fulfilled her promise and rose once more to become a nation again.
many thanks, Hamza. All of our parliamentarians are working like all SNP members are as independence ambassadors, making the case directly with the different parts of society they deal with as part of their portfolio or campaign responsibilities. Another of these independence ambassadors uh, is the newly elected MSP for the South of Scotland, Aileen MacLeod, and I'd like you to give to a, a big welcome to the stage. Aileen. <laughs> Much delegates. In the conference, it is a tremendous honour and a real privilege to be one of your ambassadors for independence in Scotland's forthcoming referendum campaign. And it is a fantastic opportunity to be part of a team working together with all of you in taking the message of independence out there across the whole of Scotland. Now, as some of you will know, I spent five years working in the European Parliament in Brussels as Alan Smith's Head of Policy. And during that time, I met many colleagues from across the EU representing countries that had only relatively recently gained their independence and completed the journey that we are on. Now, they never regarded our goal to be an independent country as anything other than normal. And these colleagues look forward to the day Scotland takes its rightful place in the international community of nation states. For them, independence means sitting at the EU's top table, delivering policies that benefit their countries and meeting the aspirations of their citizens, as well as working with other countries as equal partners. Now, independence provided opportunities which otherwise were simply not open to these countries. It is the normal state of affairs and it is an opportunity to be grasped. And it is also an opportunity that is now within the reach of the people of Scotland. Delegates, I had the opportunity to see on a daily basis the success of these modern, dynamic and confident countries, able to defend their own interests and put their own case forward on the international stage. That is Scotland's future and that is one that we will deliver. Now, since I was elected in May, I've been spending time talking to universities and academics about the issues they want to see addressed as part of the conversation that we are having ahead of the referendum. So I'm already out there discussing with them how they and the university sector will benefit from independence. Conference, the time is right for us to have this conversation, and not only with the universities, but across the whole of Scotland. And a couple of weeks ago, I took part in a debate on independence at Scotland's National Booktown Festival in Wigton. It was a fascinating event. The overwhelming sense I had was of an audience ready and willing to have a very serious discussion about independence. The debate reflected a real desire from folk to understand just what an independent Scotland would mean for them, how it would make their lives better, how it would benefit them, their families and their futures. The audience didn't want to hear from the op opposition, in this case it was Lord Fraser, about what we couldn't do. They wanted to hear from the SNP about what Scotland can do. Now, the people of Scotland are in listening mode, and it is up to us, all of us, to take our message out there that only as an independent country can Scotland fulfil its potential and meet the aspirations of its citizens. And we are pushing at an open door. Our people are now ready to have that conversation and are ready to be persuaded. Delegates, I'm excited. I'm very excited of what we are on the brink of achieving. So let's go out there and continue our work with the people of Scotland and deliver independence.
So it's already clear that our parliamentarians, whether MSPs, MPs, MEPs or government ministers, are now working as independence ambassadors at a national level. At the same time, we're doing so at a community level, and that is step four of the independence referendum campaign, where our local elected representatives and all members will reach out within our communities, door by door, street by street, in the most unprecedented campaign of mobilisation and communication by the SNP and in the history of Scottish politics. Already, work is going on in different communities as we speak. In this area, Councillor Drew Hendry is working together with colleagues for a Highland Council by-election victory in Inverness and on the independence referendum. Please welcome Drew Hendry. What a, what a great conference and what great confidence it must give to people of Scotland to hear what's been said here. We have a, an opportunity to embark on a really exciting journey to Scotland's referendum. Locally, here in Highland, as in many council areas, we've been working since May to make sure that we're on the road to delivering the right result in that referendum when, we, when it comes, but also to make sure that we have a full victory in next year's May elections. With Ken Gowans, we've been out on the doorsteps, working hard, knocking in, speaking to people, and the result we've got has been fantastic. People are engaging. You ask them, do you support independence? They're saying, yes. You ask them, will you vote for the SNP? And they're saying, yes. More people are asking to join the party when we knock on doors than ever before. As Richard Lockhead said this morning, Scotland has an abundance. Well, we have an abundance of people with talent here and around Scotland, and we have an abundance of talent for the council elections coming up. We'll be in full flow to make sure that the council elections are a waymark on the road to independence. Here, we'll do everything we can to move Highland forward and we know that we'll be doing everything in Scotland to move Scotland forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Drew. What Drew's just been describing is what we must do, not just in a by-election, not just in the run-up to the local council elections, but until the independence referendum itself. We can take heart from the recent opinion polls, one which showed a majority for Scottish independence across the whole UK and also amongst respondents in Scotland. A recent TNS poll also showed independence in the lead and perhaps more significantly showed the number of those opposing independence down seven points while those undecided up by five points. And what that means is that there is a direct movement from those previously opposed to independence who now support it, as well as a substantial number of people who've moved from being opposed to now being undecided. What this shows is that many, many voters are in listening mode. All feedback that we have had from around the country indicates that the mood of the public is interested in independence. That's why I firmly believe that the majority of people in Scotland want to be persuaded to vote for independence. So our independence campaign starts now. It's starting, as it said on the screen. The starting gun is being fired now. We will leave nothing to chance. So we will galvanize and motivate our members and supporters. We will work with the many supporters of independence with no party affiliation and those in other parties. We will engage with different sectors of society to raise confidence, optimism and understanding of the independence case. And we will reach out within our communities door by door, street by street in the most unprecedented campaign of mobilisation and communication by the SNP and in the history of Scottish politics. To help us do that, we need independence referendum campaign materials. And today, you have the tools to kickstart that campaign. On the way in, you were given a campaign bag of materials emblazoned with the message, Scotland, it's starting. The campaign pack includes the publication. Ah, ah, 
as some of, some of you have, some of you have still to get. If you don't have, on the way out, you can get, there are more, in your pack, in your pack, you will find the publication, Your Scotland, Your Future. It's an introductory document for the campaign, which will be supplemented in the run-up to the referendum uh, by the Scottish Government. You'll be proud that the referendum case is a positive one, which underscores the need for independence while reinforcing the value of our links with our neighbours and friends. The campaign pack also includes a campaign leaflet, Your Scotland, Your Future, as well as a campaign card. All of these materials are linked to a new website, www www.scotlandforward.net There's also a Twitter feed at Scotland Forward. The campaign pack also includes a campaign wristband. <laughs> ah, ah, you know we're off now. <laughs> it has a saltire on it. It has Scotland, it started. And there are also campaign pens. All of these materials will be available to order as you get your activities underway. So, fellow nationalists, this is it. It's starting. This is the roadmap to independence. It is the biggest ever campaign in our history. It will reach every household. It will reach every voter in Scotland. We will speak with as many voters as possible. Supporters, waverers, and people who have yet to be convinced. This campaign is not for the SNP. It's a campaign for Scotland. This is a campaign for everyone who lives in this country, regardless of where you come from. This is a campaign to secure the best for our communities. This is a campaign to secure the best for our families and societies. This campaign is for everyone, regardless of which party you have voted for. It's starting, so join us and help us win Scotland's future. Thank you very much. to invite John Swinney, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Sustainable Growth to address conference. John Swinney, MSP. Fellow Nationals, I can recommend these fashionable wristbands to you. Uh, <laughs> An excellent product. Uh, conference, uh, I welcome the opportunity to bring this conference to a close with uh, what has been a, a landmark and successful event for our party. A landmark as it's our first gathering since we became Scotland's first majority government and probably the largest gathering in the party's history. successful because we've debated and discussed the issues that matter to our people and set out how we are moving Scotland forward. And that is what we should do. This party represents every community of Scotland, urban and rural, island and mainland, north, south, east and west, constituency members in every nook and cranny of Scotland. We are the party that speaks for everyone in Scotland. It's a huge privilege for me to serve Scotland as the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth. I'm supported by a strong team. Fergus Ewing, Minister for Energy, Enterprise and Tourism, building the case for renewables, working closely with the oil and gas sector to develop their potential, supporting our economic agenda, 
and making Scottish tourism the world leader that we know it can be. Aileen Campbell, Minister for Local Government, developing our partnership with local government and improving the efficiency of the planning process. An old hand and a new broom, working with me to make Scotland more successful, supported by Mark MacDonald, our Parliamentary Liaison Officer. Please join me in thanking an outstanding team in government. At the heart of my responsibilities conference, my duty to the people and the Government of Scotland is to give careful management to the public finances of our country. It's up to me to make sure that we balance the books. For four years, as a minority government, we set a budget and we delivered a balanced budget. We created no debt, we lived within our means, financial commitments delivered in each and every year we held office. And that wasn't just the good times. That wasn't just in the good times. This party had the courage to face the task of reducing public spending in the face of London Labour's economic catastrophe and after the savage cuts of the Tory Lib Dem government. Difficult decisions, painful decisions, decisions taken weeks before an election. We had the courage to face up to our responsibilities to Scotland and the people of Scotland trusted us in return. And perhaps they did that because they had an insight into what Alistair Darling might tell us in his memoirs about Labour's financial management. Labour, the party that has sneered at us since our foundation, the party that told us they knew how to run the economy better than we could, the party that said they had financial competence in office. Alistair Darling tells us stories of budget battles that went on for months and years. He tells us of budgets being written on the morning they were being delivered. From the heart of government, the former Chancellor tells us of constant infighting, endless interfering from number 10, bad mouthing of the Chancellor by the Prime Minister's sidekicks, and I quote directly from the Chis memoirs, there was a permanent air of chaos and crisis. After these revelations, and after the trouncing they took at the May elections, all I say to Labour is this. Don't dare give me any lectures about economic and financial competence. Yeah. And if I was planning to lift the lid on the internal dialogue of the SNP government about the spending review, what would I say? <laughs> well, that got them listening, didn't it? <laughs> what I would characterise is a cabinet that decided in June that its priorities in the spending review would be to support economic recovery, protect frontline services, and deliver a decisive shift towards preventative spending. And a team of colleagues who didn't work against me during the spending review, but worked with me. And a First Minister that kept in touch with me to say what could he do to help bring about an outcome we could all agree. That is sensible government acting on behalf of the people of this country. A judgment on any government is what are its actions in the tough times. Now we know what Labour wanted to do. Having squandered money in the good times, they wanted, we know what they wanted to do in the bad times. Alistair Darling promised cuts that were tougher and deeper than those of Margaret Thatcher. And I shall remind the Labour Party of that comment when they constantly asked to spend more money in the months that lie ahead in the budget process. The Lib Dems, well they said they did not want to support any dramatic cuts in public spending, but have gone to it with the zeal of a convert. The Tories of course have done what we knew the Tories would always do, but 
but their task has been made a great deal easier by the human shield offered by the Liberal Democrats. Now, what have we done? At the first sign of trouble, we've protected what matters to the people. The NHS getting all of the Barnet consequentials as we promised. Local government getting a fair deal. Money in place to freeze the council tax. To give a thousand extra police officers on the streets. Scrapping prescription charges. Reintroducing free education. It's required pay restraint. We've had to make cuts. But we've done that with a guarantee of no compulsory redundancies within the government and the National Health Service. It's what we call the social wage. These are the actions of a government working with the grain of Scotland in touch with the people of our country. Our government is focused always on its duty to prepare Scotland for the future. Our infrastructure, our people and our nation always acting to do the right thing for Scotland. This conference is focused on the greatest issue facing Scotland today, building economic recovery and creating jobs. That's the Government's focus and we work with everyone in Scotland who has a positive contribution to make to this effort. In the spending review, we put the priority on delivering jobs and growth. We took a set of decisions to use the full powers we have to make a difference for Scotland. We know that there are limitations to what we can do. That is the reality of devolution. But we've used every ounce of flexibility we have, every inch of initiative that we can take. Investment in the capital infrastructure of our country is critical to recovery. We could have accepted the malicious Westminster cuts to our capital budget of 36% over four years and said there was nothing we could do about it. But Scotland's future is too important not to challenge the Westminster folly. We took decisive action to invest in communities across Scotland, to support and promote jobs growth, taking forward the £2.5 billion pipeline of projects using our non-profit distributing model, switching over three quarters of a billion pounds from revenue to support capital spending, prioritising key projects such as the fourth replacement crossing and the new South Glasgow Hospital and the school building programme, taking forward our manifesto promises to deliver 30,000 new affordable homes over this Parliament. Despite the sabotage from London, Scotland's capital budget will grow in each of the next three years to deliver the jobs and growth our people need. That's an SNP government delivering real action for Scotland. We're working hard, colleagues, to create the best conditions for employment. In the last 12 months, at a time when unemployment has risen by 113,000 in the UK, unemployment has fallen by 17,000 in Scotland. Despite the challenges, Scotland today has lower unemployment, higher employment, lower economic inactivity rates than the rest of the United Kingdom. We're acting to tackle youth unemployment. We're investing in a record 25,000 modern apprenticeships each year, as well as the Opportunities for All programme that will give a guarantee of training or learning to every 16 to 19 year old. These are difficult times and we will do all that we can do and need to do to give our young people the best start that they deserve in the life of work and learning that they face up to. We are sharpening our focus to continue to grow our economy through measures such as investing in Scotland's natural competitive advantages in the low carbon economy, focusing on improving the performance of companies in exporting and making sure that government contracts are available to our small and medium sized companies to assist their growth and we are maintaining the small business bonus scheme that has cut or abolished the business rates of 80,000 businesses in Scotland. Conference, I give Scotland the commitment today our government will use every one of our limited existing powers to deliver economic growth for Scotland. But our actions delegates have been thwarted by the Condemns Coalition's failed policies. We need to see action from the Westminster Government. We've called for a Plan McB to put in place the support that is necessary to encourage growth. We call for greater access to finance, having brought in ourselves the Scottish Investment Bank. 
We call for help for families to boost consumer confidence, having frozen the council tax for four years. We call for greater capital and expenditure, having increased the capital budget that was slashed by the UK Government. The UK Government has delivered nothing like the sort of dynamic intervention that is required to boost economic growth. So I say to the United Kingdom Government today, get your heads out of the sand, recognise your cuts agenda is harming Scotland and invest in economic recovery. great tests of a government is whether it takes decisions that equip the country for the future. That challenge is all the greater when the country faces the enormous financial constraints that we confront. But despite that difficulty, this government is taking bold decisions to prepare Scotland for the future. Governments for years have said that preventative spending was a good idea, but it was too difficult to find the money. There was always a more pressing problem of today to put off preparing for tomorrow. This government won't shortchange Scotland on its future. We've taken the decision to make a decisive shift to preventative spending. This historic investment to prevent problems by intervening earlier is the right approach to tackling social and other issues as well as providing better value for the taxpayer. It of course comes at a price. It involves increasing the business rates of large retailers who sell tobacco and alcohol, the source of many of our health and social problems in Scotland today, equivalent to just 0.1% of retail turnover in Scotland. I don't think that's too much to ask highly profitable retailers to make a contribution to creating a better future for our people. This is a decisive shift in the Government's focus, a decisive shift in the focus of Scotland. And over the next three years, we will boost preventative spending initiatives by focusing on supporting adult social care, focusing on early years and the opportunities for our children, and focusing on reducing reoffending. £500 million to support preventative spending in Scotland in the tough times this Government has taken the bold decisions to equip Scotland for the future. But we have another duty. If we want to create the best conditions for the economy, we have got to have the tools to enable us to act. Instead of being frustrated by Westminster's decision to dump the Long Island Carbon Capture Project, we should be able to access the £13 billion in oil revenues pouring into the UK Treasury to invest in technology that will give our country a world lead. When public sector workers feel rightly angry at the raid on their pensions by the Tory Lib Dem government, we should be able to take our own decision without a UK government threatening financial blackmail of the Scottish Government. When a London The economic recessions of the 1980s, the 1990s or the 21st century had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with independence. They happened under the Union. The squandering of £300 billion of North Sea oil revenues had absolutely nothing to do with independence. That happened under the Union. The reading of pension funds by Gordon Brown had nothing to do with independence. That happened under the Union. The banking crisis had nothing to do with independence. That happened under the Union. That's the reality 
of what the Union has delivered for Scotland. The figures show that with a geographical share of our offshore resources, Scotland would be the sixth wealthiest country in the world, ten places ahead of the UK at 16th. This is the time to put the wealth of Scotland to work for the people of Scotland. At the start of my speech, I spoke of our representation across Scotland, north, south, east and west, representing every part of Scotland in the Scottish Parliament. So too must be our representation in the local authorities of Scotland. We've taken a refreshing course in working with local government. We ended the days of petty squabbling between national and local government. We built a relationship based on cooperation, on collaboration, on joint priorities to build the future of our communities in Scotland. That relationship has worked well for Scotland and we are committed to it. The Council elections next May are the opportunity to take that forward. But they are an opportunity to do something else. They are an opportunity to complete what we did in May 2011. They are the opportunity to rid Scotland of Labour municipalism. Good people in our communities, badly let down by Labour control. Let's bring to an end the last vestige of Labour failure in Scotland and win the local authority elections. I first came to this event as a teenager and in the intervening, I'm afraid to say, 30 years or so, I've seen this party grow and grow and grow. And as other parties have chopped and changed and ducked and dived, we have stuck true to the clear and compelling idea that gave life to our party 77 years ago. The idea that it is best that the people who choose to live in this country should shape her future. To be honest, there were many times I sat in this conference hall and wondered, even doubted, if our original yet beautiful idea would ever succeed. And look at us now. We have literally had to squeeze ourselves into this magnificent conference venue. We have the largest number of councillors of any party in our country. We are in our second term in government, and we are now the majority government of Scotland, and we have the platform, as we have just so magnificently heard, to call a referendum on independence. This is it, my friends. This is our moment. This is our chance to fulfil the promise we made to our people. The promise that every person who chooses to live in this country should have the chance to shape the future of our country. Our task is now quite simple. We must go out and persuade and inspire the people of our country that independence will be right for them. That is our task. Today, let us commit to fulfil our promise to the people of Scotland. Thank you very much.
An item we can't leave without doing, that's to draw the raffle for the conference car to be drawn by a deputy leader of the party, Nicola Sturgeon. Once again, sorry, Dad. <laughs> oh, and happy birthday, Mum. <laughs> Pamela Masson. Is Pamela here? Do you know Pamela? Excellent. Well, we'll make sure the car is on its way to Pamela. Well done, indeed. Conference. It's now time to bring our conference to a close. I know, I know. This is the 77th annual conference of the SNP. An extraordinary and historic event. More delegates, more members, more exhibitors and more diplomatic observers than ever before. And I hope you agree that this has been our best ever conference. I'm delighted you agree. <laughs> Can I make uh, one prediction, however? We won't be waiting another 77 years for independence. <laughs> now, I'd like to give the vote of thanks because big events like this uh, don't happen naturally. It's a, an enormous collaborative effort. So let me thank all those who have contributed uh, to this conference to make it such a remarkable success. Can I thank Paul, Emma, Claire, Janet and the other 143 stewards and bar staff at the Eden Court Theatre who have shepherded us and looked after us so well, keeping us fed and watered with Caledonian catering also. And thank Graham and the team at Tents and Events who, battling against the storms on Tuesday and Wednesday, erected a huge marquee, nearly as big as Eden Court itself, to accommodate all the extra exhibitors and members that we've had along. <laughs> and of course, Highland Council, who gave us a, a very warm welcome, and in particular, Convener Sandy Park for welcoming us once again back to Inverness. And of course, I'd like to thank the police and Billy Kirkwood of his security group team for managing access and keeping us safe and secure throughout conference. And thanks to the technical guys at MCL for their amazing giant screen, which always made us look, I like to think so, looked and sounded good throughout conference. <laughs> Duke, Dino, Andy, Martin, Ash and Stuart. Sure. conference, please thank, show your gratitude to all the exhibitors, sponsors and fringe meeting or organisers who have kept us informed, stimulated and sharing their hospitality. <laughs> Can we also thank Chief Steward Anne Allen and her great team of eagle-eyed stewards. And can I make a special mention of one steward who sadly passed away prior to conference, Alec Williamson, who was probably known to many of you for his friendliness and I know it's sadly missed. 
by the stewards team and Erica. I hope you feel the affection that there is for Stuart. Alec Williamson. And thank you, of course, to our headquarters team and Peter Murrell, our chief executive. Also, Trudy Logan, who put together much of the mechanics and logistics for conference. Such a dynamic conference, so thank you, Trudy. Can we thank the press team, led by Liz Lloyd, for getting us on the front pages over the last few days at conference. And Professor James Mitchell for a magnificent contribution to our conference and a thought-provoking Donaldson lecture, reminding us of our social union with the neighbouring unions in the British Isles. <laughs> and delegates and members, can I thank you for your cooperation at conference? Your support has done so much to help make this the fantastic conference that it has been. And a particular thank you to the first time visitors to our party conference. Thank you. You know, conference, the pace of change in our country has been breathtaking. We've become the mold breakers of Scottish politics. In 2007, we became the Government of Scotland. We broke the mould. When that government enacted world-leading climate change targets, we led radical change. We set new records when we became the majority government in Scotland earlier this year. But we are not interested in power for ourselves, but power for our nation and our people. Power so that we can build a new Scotland, a fairer, stronger, greener and more prosperous Scotland and more compassionate too. We can do this, but only by gaining control of the economic levers that will shape our future destiny. Never has politics in Scotland been so exciting, exhilarating. Never has our membership been so excited. Now there's great support out there. Let's capitalise on that support and double the membership of this party before we enter the independence referendum. <laughs> Conference. The SNP has shifted the teutonic plates of Scottish politics. This weekend we have assembled from every part of Scotland and at the local elections, we will win in every part of Scotland too. <laughs> Scotland's party, the Scottish Government, the party of local government also. Our Holyrood victory in May was not the end, it is the beginning. The beginning of our campaign to move our country forward. Forward conference, forward to independence. <laughs> now, conference, I would like to invite Peter Kelly to sing Scots Wahe. Peter Kelly is a well-known local singer-songwriter and SNP supporter. He's taken part in local shows for 25 years, and amongst other achievements, he wrote the lyrics to Highland Cathedral. Today, he will lead us in the words of the Bard for Scots Wahey. Scots were were Wallace Glen, Scots Wombrose has often led. Welcome to your gory bed, or to bed. 
victory. Now's the day and now's the hour. See the front of battle hour. See approach proud Edward's power. Chains and slavery. say this. We know what we've got to do, so let's go on with it. Thank you. Yeah.